in the state of California, taxes are obviously horrible. So when I get my paycheck every two weeks from do, being a lifeguard, I'd look at it and just think, how on earth they took most of what I had? And it was from that moment on that when I finally got paid for doing these landscaping, obviously you still have to pay your taxes on it. But as a business owner, you can write some of that off. And that's a whole conversation in and of itself. But I just remember that feeling of joy I got from saying, I earned this completely on my merit for something I was doing and I paid myself through it. And ever since then, it's been a passion of mine. In order to live an extraordinary and abundant life, you must focus on your internal battle and win within. My name is Randy Wilson and welcome to the Rich Mind Podcast. All right, everyone, welcome back to the Rich Mind Podcast. And today, coming back to you with another fantastic guest. I'm super excited about this conversation we're about ready to have. If you followed my podcast for any amount of time, you'll know that I'm super passionate about trying to give back to that younger generation. I have kids that are, my oldest is 26. I've got a 24-year-old daughter and a 22-year-old daughter. And I do my best to try to share with them nuggets of wisdom, things that I've learned in my journey. But at the same time, sometimes it doesn't quite land because of the age gap and, and I'm their dad and all that kind of stuff. But one passion I have is talking to individuals that are out there and accomplishing big things, but are also part of this younger generation. And that's exactly what I found with, with our guest today, Brandon Davis. Brandon is an entrepreneur and CEO of Interval, a virtual AI receptionist for automotive businesses. He's also the founder of Get Over Yourself LLC, a podcast platform dedicated to help young adults destroy their self-limitations and grow outside of their comfort zone in business and in life. He's a huge baseball fan. He loves watching the LA Dodgers and working out in his spare time. He's also married. He just shared with me. He just passed his one-year anniversary of being married. And he's also, I believe you're coming to us from Provo, Utah. Is that Provo? Provo, Utah. Provo, yep. Yep, home of the Cougars. Go Cougs. Go Cougs. But without further ado, man, I just I'm super excited about this conversation. Just even the, the couple of minutes we had before we hit record here. We're we're fun. I said, man, we gotta get this started, get recorded, man. This is gonna be too good. So, anyways, Brandon, appreciate you coming on the show. Hey, yeah, thanks for having me, Randy. I'm excited to hopefully drop a couple nuggets, um, especially for some of the younger listeners you have on the show, anybody that sometimes goes through that exact same dilemma of, eh, I've heard this from the older folk every single time. Not that you're old, Randy, <laughs> but what I'm getting at is sometimes, oh, yeah. sometimes we need to hear it from somebody uh, closer to us. You know, it's, it's, it's all good, man. You're not going to hurt my feelings. I, I've, I've come to grips. I'm the old guy in the room most of the time, right? So the, the ability to have a conversation with young folks, I mean, my kids especially, but obviously young folks like such as yourself, I think it'd be super valuable, right? Just get different perceptions of where you're at, what you're seeing. I wanted to, you, I mentioned you've got an AI business, a startup that you're starting up that I would love to get into details, kind of what you're thinking and what you're seeing for that moving forward. And obviously we'll get to those things as we get going here in the episode. But first off, man, take a few minutes, tell everybody, I went through the high level bullet point list of yourself. Tell everybody a little bit more about yourself. Tell us your story, kind of where you've been, where you are, and obviously where you see yourself going. Yeah, before I jump all in on me, 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 I want to applaud you, Randy, for what you're doing. Um, sometimes it's very difficult to grow a platform where people can be engaged and appreciate a conversation. So first off, congrats to that. And also what you're doing. A lot of times it's interesting when I kind of put myself out there as a guest. Nobody ever blatantly says it, um, but you can always see in, in the back of somebody's eyes sometimes when they think, okay, he's just a young guy. He doesn't understand much about the world. And yes, I, in a lot of cases, I 100% agree. There's a lot of circumstances and life experiences I haven't had yet. And I can't relate to everybody on that. But at the same time, what you're doing with being able to connect to somebody um, and reach out generation to generation, I think that's more important than anything. And that's something I struggled with at the beginning of my show as well, getting guests who are a lot older than me and there'd be some kind of disconnect. But after working through that over the last couple of years, it's, it's been something super special. So congrats to you first off. Appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, like you mentioned, um, I'm a massive Dodgers fan. Grew up in Southern California. I got to start I there. Say because... massive. Yeah, I didn't say massive. I didn't realize how big it was. I had a feeling it was pretty big. But yeah, massive Dodgers fan. Okay, please continue. It's, it's got to, you got to put that out there these days because you either have the ones who are just like joining. What's the word you call it when you just join the team that's winning? You're, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here, Randy? Just joining the bandwagon? 
Yeah, bandwagon. Kind of there you go. You're joining the bandwagon of the team. So you got those Dodger fans. You got everyone in the world who hates the Dodgers now ever since shi- signing Shohei Otani and mm-hmm. our massive power team. And then you got diehard fans since I was born and raised like me. So I got to preface that. Anyone who is absolutely angry with me at that, sorry. Grew up with it. <laughs> it's my life. That's where I am. There you go. You just got to own it. Yep. Um, yeah. Other than that, um, kind of been into my entrepreneurial ship journey for the past 23 years. That's how old I am. Um, and so I credit literally from some of my youngest moments back when I was in elementary school to up to where I'm at right now, all of it has kind of some stepping stones and little increments inside of the process of where we're at today. And where we're at today, I'm going to be saying that exact same thing in 20 years from now and 20 years from that. Um, and that's a big portion of what I try and emulate my life around is just making sure everything's a learning opportunity from the goods, the bads and the uglies. Um, But a lot of my entrepreneurial journey started, like I mentioned back when I was younger, uh, from just flipping water bottles on the school campus. You know, you buy up a case and you sell them for a dollar on campus and fun things like that. Um, My first official business I actually had registered with the state of California growing up was a landscape business. Um, I had an old beat up pickup truck when I was a junior in high school. I had a friend who had some lawn care equipment. I've been cutting my family's grass and my grandparents' grass for years. He'd been cutting his family's and a couple of neighbors. And we said, you know, I don't make anything at my house. My grandpa pays me about once every four months. You don't really make any money at your neighbors, but we're halfway decent at this. So let's go take it to a couple people. And so our first official business, we'd drive around, we'd hop up in the in the truck, get all of our gear, and we'd go door to door in my hometown and just knock on people's doors with the absolute worst sales pitch, horrible sales pitch. We just mentioned that we were local high school students and pray that they would let us cut their grass. It worked out halfway decent, maybe just because we were nice kids, who knows? But um, and that's where I first got introduced to kind of sales and starting my own business. Um, overall. And this is the kind of preface I'll take and let you lead into this, Randy. Um, The biggest lesson I learned inside of that experience was the value of working for myself and making my own dollar bill. Um, At the time when I was actually doing landscaping, um, and by landscaping, we're talking cutting your grass, edging, cleaning up the trees, basic stuff. But as I was doing this and I was making money for myself for the first time ever, at the same time, I worked as a lifeguard. So when I wasn't lifeguarding and I had a day off or whatever the shift might look like, that's when my friend and I were out cutting people's grass. In the state of California, taxes are obviously horrible. So when I get my paycheck every two weeks from being a lifeguard, I'd look at it and just think, how on earth they took most of what I had? And it was from that moment on that when I finally got paid for doing these landscaping, obviously you still have to pay your taxes on it, but as a business owner, you can write some of that off and that's a whole conversation in and of itself. But I just remember that feeling of joy I got from saying, I earned this completely on my merit for something I was doing and I paid myself through it. And ever since then, it's been a passion of mine. That's awesome. So the first thing that's come to my mind, first question. So are you from California and then LLA? You've mentioned that a few times. Is that why you're such a big Dodgers fan? Of I course, yeah. you're, you're in Utah, so you, you're from L.A.? Yep. So I've kind of lived all over. I grew up preschool to graduating high school. I lived in um, Southern California, a town called Hemet, okay. a couple hours outside of L.A., depending on traffic, of course. Um, and then since then, I've lived in Brazil. I've lived in Tennessee. I've lived in Florida and Utah and Texas. So kind of bounced around since then. Okay, cool. Very good. I just wanted to put that Dodger where you lived connection together there. So got to make it. <laughs> yeah, you got to make that connection for sure. So then the the next part of that, what you just shared there, and tell me if this resonates with you at all. I The way I try to frame it with my kids is, and other people too, that will listen to me. Just, and some people don't want to listen. And that's okay too. But the, there's a difference between earning money and making money. Mm-hmm. And I know that's like, does that resonate with you as far as you were talking about how as a business owner you're making your you're making money right versus going to work and getting paid at a job where you're earning money and obviously paying taxes first just i was just curious does that resonate with you at all just that that difference definitely and half the time on the specific tax details I always consult a CPA because i'm going to yes, mess up on 100%. telling any information on that to give some framework before I started working on this AI tech startup, this is about two years ago. Um, there's a young startup here in Provo, Utah, as I was in college, and um, I started working for them. And one of the initial things they had listed on their job posting was, I believe it was going to be like 16 bucks an hour or something. Obviously not life-changing money, but for when you're in college, it's working fine. And I remember I was reaching out to 
them at the time. And I mentioned, I said, Hey, just so you know, I know you're a young startup. I know you're not making a ton of money right now. Um, I need to pay rent and get food. And that's about all my expenses go towards. If you guys need, I'm here for the experience, not so much of the money. And so we, we ended up, I negotiated myself a lower salary. I made less money than that was on the job posting. Um, the reason for that though, is because what you're saying there of earning money versus working for it in life, you can be given a job. Anyone could go out and get a job. There's a million ways you can do it on Indeed or local connections, Facebook groups. You can go out and get a job. But if you're just working a job that's going to sit back, you're going to do the same mundane tasks every single day. You're not going to learn. You're not going to grow. You're not going to have any room to grow. I don't see that as actually earning value. And so sure, you might get a stupid piece of paper that says $100 on it every couple of weeks. And that's how you pay your rent. And I understand that's how life works. But there's better ways of going about it than just working in the same mundane tasks over and over that are not teaching you anything. You're not really providing any real value. You could be replaced within 10 minutes. I don't think that's what the human experience is all about. I don't either. That's super cool. So let's go back into then in your early stages of entrepreneurship. You mentioned about you know when you're a kid buying water, cases of water, selling them to the, I can just see you sit out there right on the, on the ball fields or whatever, just offering bottles of water, you're buying them for five bucks and you're selling them a dollar a piece. Obviously you can do the math on the profit on that type of thing. Where did that inspiration come from? Are you, are you around? Did you have a family of entrepreneurs? Where did that, where did that come from? Just out of curiosity. Yeah. So I credit a lot of my young love for business to my father, actually. Um, it's pretty unique. My family situation. I have the I'm kind of split down the middle of family who's kind of worked on their own businesses to the ones who kind of get corporate jobs to the ones who like my mom, she had the hardest job of all, which was being a stay at home mom for me and my siblings. So like in my family, both in my parents, as well as aunts, uncles, cousins, et cetera, I have a wide range of, you know, the corporate to starting your own business to everything in between lifestyle. What kind of got me going at a younger age was my dad. He's an attorney. Um, and that's a story way in and of itself of his journey through becoming an attorney. So obviously, as the stereotype goes, attorneys work a lot of hours. And there's a lot of tedious work. There's a lot of busy work. And there's a lot of things you just need to get done every single day to keep the clients happy and make sure you're filling out the right forms. You're doing everything that you need to get done for them. Um, so when I was growing up, one of the most amazing qualities he had was um, despite how busy he was or how hard of a day it was, whatever it may be, he made sure he was at home in the evening for dinner or at our sporting events and spending time with me, my siblings, and then of course my mom. And I feel like that's very overlooked these days because you can get inside the hustle culture, especially for, as we're talking about business a lot on this episode, you can go and say, I'm going to work the 90 hour work weeks and cut out everyone in my life. And I guess teach their own. But one value that he instilled in me was making sure that we could spend time together. So to, to um, kind of add a caveat here, he would go through and some nights when we would eat dinner, it'd be 30 minutes late compared to what my mom would schedule, but we'd get there, we'd all eat dinner together and um, he would still have work to do. And so our kind of bonding time, it wasn't always just like direct one-on-one -on -one communication or anything. But one thing that we valued together was we'd sit on the couch after a long day and I'd be younger. So I'd finish up my homework. He'd open up his laptop. He'd kick his feet up on the, t on the couch. We'd either turn on the Dodger game or if they weren't in season, we would uh, start watching Shark Tank's a ABC Shark Tank. And so back when I was younger, that was kind of my first introduction to business was just watching Shark Tank with my dad. And I think since it was such a fun experience I had with him, it kind of translated to as I got older, I realized, okay, I saw these people on the TV. They're ordinary people you would see at a grocery store, at your local church congregation, you know, outside at the park. They're these average people, yet they were making something extraordinary a business or a product that was literally helping people change their lives and they were doing so and making a lot of money at the same time. So I think that experience of watching it with my dad is like a happy memory mixed in with seeing these people who are making and creating something amazing. It just combined into kind of where we're at today. That's, that's, that's awesome. So Shark Tank has been, and folks, if you're not watching Shark Tank, you can see all the episodes or all the reruns and, and all that right now. Still, I still watch them to this day. You same. know, you have to watch the live things. Yeah. It's just a, if you're into business and if you want to just kind of get a, a fire hose, you know, there it's still a 30,000 foot view, but it numbers and just how those, the minds work and the businesses and all that. It's just a super cool experience. Yeah. I totally agree with the shark tank thing for sure. 
Yeah. That's awesome. And I wish I would have found it like you at your age versus me and my older stages of life. So that's, that's super cool as well. So let's, you mentioned about the hustle culture. I would love to get your, we have, I didn't, I didn't even have that question in mind before we hit record here. So I'm curious of what you think about that because I see it in the media that I see, right? There's folks that are out there preaching it, right? You need to to grind your face off and you need to work until your basically your limbs are falling off. Right. And that's, that's the only way to make it out there in society. What is your opinion? You've been, you know, you've got started a few businesses, right? You've had some success. Yeah. Just curious on what, what your thoughts are at your stage. Yeah, definitely. I am stealing this from actually a college professor I had. Um, my favorite professors throughout my college experience have been um, adjunct professors. These are professors who didn't go get their PhD. They weren't the ones who you know, got paid for the last 40 years of their life to be up and coming ranks in the system. These are ones who, especially in the business program, they were ones who started their own business and they came back to BYU to teach and simply do it just because they wanted to help other students. So there's one in particular, I was in his class and we had a discussion on um, work-life balance. And when we were in that class, obviously the cliche phrase that everyone recognizes is work-life balance. Um, one thing that he changed my mindset on that day was changing the word or the phrase work-life balance and putting the word harmony in there. And so instead of mm -hmm. work-life balance, it's work-life harmony. And since then, I've heard this from multiple people. So he's not the first to come up with this theory either, but it's something that's made a lasting impact on me. And it's the idea of, yes, at certain points in your life, you're going to be working harder. You're going to be working more hours. You're going to be putting more time in the arena. But at other points inside of your life, because you added that extra time a couple of weeks ago or a couple of months ago, a couple of years ago, whatever that may be, there's also going to be periods in your life where you can relax a little bit more and join the moments a little bit more, be there for people more, you know? And so inside of my life, I mean, Interval, our, our tech startup here, we've been going about a year now. And so obviously there's, there's longer days and there's longer nights. There's also plenty of times where we leave at a reasonable hour. But what I always try and do is instead of make that balance where it's perfectly equal on both sides, I try and create harmony. So say one week, there's a little bit more extra work to get done. Um, school's going crazy. We're working extra hours and I can't spend as much time with my wife. Those are the weeks where, yes, of course, I still have to get things done. I'm going to do it. But my goal in the next week or in the next coming weeks is to make sure I set aside more time to be with her because you're never going to have that perfect equilibrium. And if you try and manage that, you're going to be putting your eggs into too many baskets at once and they're eventually going to crack. So if you can kind of say like, okay, if this week I was a little bit busier on my tasks and I wasn't able to give my focus towards my spouse, my friends, my family members, your dog, whoever that may be inside of your life who's listening, step, step back and say, okay, this week I'm working on what I need to get done and I'm going to make sure in the coming week I'm going to be able to put time aside to actually be there for whoever it is. And I had not heard that harmony using the harmony instead of balance. That's, that's very good. I like that. That was uh yeah, that's good. I'm going to use that one going forward. That's very steal good. Steal it. Because it I stole tough. it. You steal well, it. <laughs> it's tough, right? Because you do have a lot of things going on when you are your own, when you're the business owner, right? You're, you're wearing all the hats. You've got so many mm -hmm. things to get done, but you need and have obligations as well. You mentioned, or we mentioned that you're a year into your marriage. I'm several more years into mine, but at the same time, we still have obligations outside of uh, the, the business part of what we're trying to accomplish and harmony. I like that. That's, that's super cool. I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, of course. Glad I was able to get somebody who hadn't earned it yet. There we go. No, I, yeah, I had not in that way. Yeah, that was great. So you mentioned about your tech startup. So one thing that I'm super passionate about is the AI generation that's really going on out there in the world. And to hear that you've got an AI talk, a tech startup focusing on AI, that's super intriguing to me. And I would love for you to go in as deep as you'd like. So let me just preface this with folks. If you, you may or may not have heard me in the past with my episodes, I've, I've talked about AI in the past. I believe, and I'm old enough to remember before the internet. So that dates me. That's how old I am. Before all the analog, I remember the dial-ups and, and I remember the first time I saw an iPhone, I was like blown away. My point being is that I feel that AI is very similar in its time frame as how the internet revolutionized how we live today. I think AI is going to take us to the next level. And I think it's going to be in a positive way. You're going to hear people saying some negative things, but you're going to have pros and cons to everything, right? The internet isn't hunky-dory 24-7 either if it's used in an improper way. So I'm curious. I honestly have not, I don't think I've, 
I currently use AI in my business, right? It helps me. I use ChatGPT or Gemini on, on Google to help me, right? And it's a tool. But for someone to actually be building out something in a form of a business, that's intriguing. So I'm going to shut up now. And I would love for you to tell us about it. Tell us about the business. Tell, tell us about your experience with AI and kind of where you see it going in your future. Yeah. So I'll preface this with it kind of caught me like it caught everyone else a couple of years ago. Um, you're reading about it. Some businesses started incorporating it. Uh, you heard about OpenAI doing what they were doing a few years ago, but it wasn't very big. Nobody realized what potential it could have until they started releasing the first versions of ChatGPT where you could actually plug in things. I still remember I was with one of my one of my roommates at the time. And we had it write us a haiku love poem for his girlfriend at the time. And we thought it was the funniest thing on earth. We're like, no way. I can't believe it could do this. Um, and we were super naive to the amount of power that could come from it. Um, and so I feel like if you're one of those people out there right now, I understand it's a buzzword these days. Every business is trying to add that word into theirs to make it look better for venture yeah. capitalists and whatnot. Every um, commercial, everything is every commercial, AIs, everything, everything has got AI as like a keyword to it. Yeah, it is. It is. Correct. You have to throw it in these days. Yeah. Um, and the reason for that is because one, it drives a lot of sales and it does work Two, If you don't have it, uh, everyone feels like you're falling behind. And I understand that could kind of rub a consumer the wrong way where that's all you're seeing. That's all you're hearing. And so you think, OK, what is this supposed to do for me specifically? But what you said about it being a new wave of technologies. 100% accurate. Um, I went to a seminar pretty recently. Um, it's about a month and a half ago. I wish I had my charts pulled up with me in my notebook with everything. Off the top of my head, I'll try and make this somewhat easy to understand. They basically pulled up a list of all these different technology waves that have been um, in the US since its founding. And there's massive technology waves, how long it would take for these waves to actually interact with the public um, and kind of their peak points and then when it started dying off or not so much as dying off but got improved so all throughout history we have these massive tech booms of um, various forms um, and it would take a few years for the public or the the people to actually adopt them and understand them and then as soon as they did it would just blow up and like you mentioned the internet's a perfect example of that um, it was created the World Wide web was created and nobody really knew what they were supposed to do with it. There's a couple people that jumped in early, these early adopters. But for the most part, everyone sat back and thought, why on earth would I ever need a computer in my house? I don't need anything like that. And now, obviously, we know how that story went. And we still use it every single day inside of our lives. Um, but it took a little bit of a learning curve. It took a few years for people to start adopting it. And what's interesting, and once again, this is why I wish I had the charts right in front of me to show you guys. But with AI... It's so easy to understand because all you're doing is typing it in and getting answers for the most part, where this this period that usually takes the humans or the people here on this earth to understand a new technology, they, for the internet, it took around six years for people to start kind of adopting it into their daily lives. AI, they started adopting it within the first three months and the boom is just going absolutely massive and crazy. And so... As I sat back, I got my co-founder. He's off screen, but he's he's over here typing away and coding away. Um, <laughs> yeah, keep working over there. We're having fun yeah. having a conversation. Keep working. He said he says you got to keep working over there, Connor. <laughs> here he Thanks, is. Connor. There he is, guys. Yeah. Thanks, Connor. Um, so yeah, as as we're meeting together and trying to figure out, okay, we we want to jump into this space because think about all the amazing companies that were started as the internet started blowing up. And if there's this much potential of how quick AI is changing the game, we wanted to jump in that space. And so after um, talking, we, we'd we come up with a thousand different ideas. We, we were in a program at BYU called Sandbox. Um, and basically Sandbox, it's the perfect ideal situation for any college student like me. Um, you get college credit to work on a tech startup. So I joined the program with the full intention of saying, okay, I'm not gonna take regular classes for the next year. I get class credit for working on a tech startup. So when me and Connor joined this program a year and a half ago, uh, we sat down to the drawing board and we came up with idea after idea after idea, failure after failure after failure. And uh, one day we were very frustrated because it kept happening where we come up with something and it didn't work out. And that's the story of all business and all life. And so we went back to the drawing boards, we hit the whiteboard, and we were just trying to figure out some pain points that both of us had seen inside of our lives. And for whatever reason, one that we both kind of struck a nerve with was we hated waiting on hold at that awful elevator music. When a company says they answer the phone for two seconds, you don't even have time to reply. And they say, may I put you on a brief hold? Boom, elevator music. Right. So at the beginning, we were like, wow, so many small businesses are not staffed enough to be able to answer these phone calls. 
we want to make something that can hopefully bridge that gap. That was our only inclination at first. And then we sat back and thought even further. We're like, okay, what's even worse than being wait, um, put on hold? Whether that's 30 seconds or 30 minutes, it's annoying. But what's even worse is when us as consumers call into a business trying to give them our money and say, take my money for whatever product or service you provide. But then they don't answer our calls or they don't answer our texts when we have questions. Like here I am as a customer trying to give you my money, but you won't respond to me. This is a battle I'm in currently. There's, there's a software I'm trying to use. Luckily, they're pretty unique. And so I haven't found anybody else who can do what they're trying to do right now. So they got me where they want me. But the issue is I, I've messaged them four times over the past two days and no one's replied to me still. I'm thinking <laughs> here, I'm trying to give you thousands of dollars for your software and you're not replying to me. Like this doesn't make sense to me. That's your next opportunity. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm going to, after I buy their software, I'm making them use our software. Yeah, I'm making exactly. them. There you but go. yeah, so it started off as that original pain point of just people hate waiting on hold. Um, and they even more so hate when businesses don't answer. And then we looked at it from the business standpoint and thought, wow, depending on the industry, if you're not answering these customer texts or phone calls, you're losing thousands of dollars a month in revenue for your product mm -hmm. or services. Um, and then the reason why we kind of jumped into the automotive space specifically is one day we heard an interesting statistic that said all 73% of all first time customers when you're calling into an automotive shop. So if Randy's our customer over here and he's calling into Davis Automotive, if he's a first time customer and he calls me and I don't answer on the first attempt, he's going to hang up and he's going to choose whatever shop is closest to his home that answers first. So for these businesses, these repair shops, they're losing northward of 4,000 bucks a month just because they weren't replying to customers fast enough. So since then, what we've been working on is, uh, as Randy alluded to, it's Interval. It's a virtual AI receptionist for automotive businesses. So the basic premise of it is when a customer calls into um, an auto repair shop, if they're unable to answer, it'll ring three times. If they're unable to answer, our software will step in. It'll pick up the phones and answer any question that the customer might have. And the entire point of it is to try and lead the customer to schedule an appointment. So their car gets in the shop and they hand over the keys for the mechanic and they can charge them um, whatever prices they do to actually work on their car. And now, instead of them losing the 4000 bucks a month, they're gaining that plus some because not only is the calls being answered when they can't answer, but they're also working 24-7 outside of office hours and on holidays and any time that somebody would ever need to call, it's able to schedule that appointment when it never was beforehand. And I can see that like improving reviews, like, you know, I mean, word of mouth, right? If somebody has a good experience, they're going to review or, or point out that so-and-so, if you need help doing this, whether they knew it or not, as far as dealing with an AI bot, I mean, it's, it's a matter of just the customer service piece is just taken care of to that next level. That's, is that, I'm sure that's a big piece of it as well. Absolutely. And we're building out um, future steps. And like I said, we're a year into the process. And so every single day, there's a million things we have to work on. Over the next coming months, we have plans of sending out automated review um, messages. So if Randy just brought his car into Davis Automotive, give it a couple days, make sure everything worked well. We'll send him texts and say, hey, I hope that went well. Is there any issues you found since we worked on the vehicle? Nope, no issues. Perfect. All right. Would you mind leaving us a review? That's a great way to get another review on Google or Yelp or whatever it may be. Um, yeah, likewise, that's... just following up with your customers, making sure they feel heard, making sure they feel valued. If there is an issue, sending that to the team immediately and saying, hey, this customer's having issues. You need to reach out to them. Just things that are often looked past because frankly, in a business, there's so many things you have to manage, especially when customer communication or custom, the customer experience isn't your, your driving force. You're there to work on cars. You're really good at working on engines. That does not mean you're very good at talking to humans. So if we can kind of bridge that gap and make sure the customer has a great experience and the business drives a lot more revenue because of it, that's where we step in and we kind of combine the two. Love that. So I want to dig in a little bit deeper there, but I've got a question first I want to run by you. Yeah. As far as just so people can get, so if people are, they might have heard AI, right? They might be somewhat familiar with it, but you made the comment and I just want to clarify something with you is that, you were struggling with coming up, you had ideas, but they weren't necessarily panning out. So the importance, at least in my experience with AI, is that the, to get the proper output, it, it's, it requires the proper input, meaning what you type in or what you ask it to do. If you're not doing that in a specific or in a, a, a narrowed down way, you're, you're not going to get the output that you're looking for. Is that, I, I'm curious, the, the failures, quote unquote, failures, failures you were having. Is that why you were, you were having some issues is that you weren't quite getting 
the input correct to get the proper output? If that is that makes sense, what I'm asking you? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> no, it, it makes sense. So when I say we had a bunch of ideas that ended up failing, they were completely random business ideas. Um, at one point, the the grand thing that we thought was going to make us a billion dollars was uh, Airbnb, but for wedding venues. And so you'd scroll through and you could see different wedding venues throughout your area and you'd see their prices, how big they are, what kind of accommodations they had. Me and Connor go into this thing thinking, oh my gosh, how has no one built this yet? This is going to be a billion dollar company. And lo and behold, no uh, wedding venues wanted to list on our site because they lost a ton of revenue because of it. It's easy to say on Airbnb and hosts already hate this enough when they cut into their profits, but when it's a couple hundred bucks a night. A small portion of that doesn't seem grand scale but when these wedding venues are up there and you know they're charging four or five six thousand dollars a night for their venue one to five percent could be a huge margin that they're losing so yeah anyways true thought it was a great idea ended up cutting it we had we had workout ideas we had um betting ideas for um people to hold bets within themselves to keep themselves held accountable we had um one of our favorite ones that actually had great feedback it just wasn't going to pay us very much money in the end um, was one we called LectureFi. We would um, have an AI transcriber. You'd press record on your phone or on your laptop. So when people were in their college lectures, it would record everything the teacher was saying. You would sit back and actually focus on what the teacher was saying, then frantically write down notes. And then you could go back, you could see the entire lecture, listen to it. It would transcribe notes, practice quizzes, things like that. Um, we had a huge wait list for it. The issue was it wasn't going to make us any money. So we scratched that idea. And then, so I guess what I'm getting at is, Ideate, innovate, try again. Ideate, innovate, try again, and over and over and over again. So we're going to get into the mindset piece here. I, I'm just digging you deep on the business part. I just know I knew that was going to be a lot of fun, but we're going to shift to the mindset piece here just a little bit. I've got one more question for you in terms of the AI, and it is kind of a mindset shift as well. If anybody's out there with some of that negative thoughts and that you know, what I mean, you're hearing the negative things about AI, but they're curious. Where do you suggest people even get started to even learn about it? Um, I've got my opinions. I'm just curious as yourself. It sounds like you're you're deep into it, right? You're actually using it as a tool to build a business. But if someone's just like, all right, I hear it's a big thing. Like you said, it's all over the commercials. It's all over. Everybody's got an AI something, but they're not. Even, they're a little bit scared to where to begin. What what's if you have somebody like that? What do you have them get started? Yeah, definitely. Obviously, just playing around with it. Much like anything in life, the best way you're going to learn is by doing it yourself. You don't get a six pack by sitting on the couch. You get a six pack by okay. actually going to the gym and doing crunches. I, I, really? I'm sorry to break it to you, Randy. I'm sorry to break I, it to I you. I didn't know that. that <laughs> yeah, that's that's heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. <laughs> that's my that's my problem. <laughs> No, but yeah, uh, actually applying it, test out a lot of these AI platforms that are already on the market. Most of them are free these days, at least the general ones, because their goal is to become, um, which is pretty interesting, different conversation. But all these ones you see popping up on the market, you see Azure, you see Gemini, like you mentioned, you see OpenAI, you see Bard, all these different competitors release most of their products for completely free or if not super cheap. And a lot of people think it's because it's not that expensive to operate, which is quite the contrary. It costs them thousands upon millions of dollars per week, depending on how the usage case, the usage cases. Um, but the reason why they're doing it so cheap right now is because they want to become the next Google. Everyone uses the Google search engine. It's clearly the dominant search engine. And so these AI companies want to become the next version of that. But anyways, off the tangent, go out there and actually try some. There's plenty of podcasts you can actually look into that talk about it plenty. Um, one that I personally know that I'm a fan of, if anyone listens to the All In podcast, they bring up these kind of topics all the time. And then on a much smaller scale, if you want to dissect things a little bit more simply, a friend of mine, his name's Christian Hammer. He started a podcast on the topic. It's called Techtastic. You can go check that one out as well. That's great. Appreciate the resource. That's I might even check that out myself. I'm trying to learn and keep up to date with it as well. I just think it's super cool. As I mentioned, I use it as a tool within my business. It helps me generate ideas, helps me a little bit with the show notes, just the basic functions that I do in my business that, uh, yeah, it's just a fantastic tool. And that's, I recommend that to everybody listening as well. Just go out there. You don't necessarily need to spend any money or very little money at least and just get started. Just play around with it. You'll be surprised. Mm -hmm. Like you said, you, what'd you say? You had a, your friend wrote a, a poem for his girlfriend or something with it a high I mean, it's just poem a very specific poem. yeah yes so it's just it, if you play around with it you'll be surprised that that number one you're gonna be blown away I, i've been blown away it's an amazing thing 
but just be open-minded to it. That would be my suggestion to you if you're having a little bit of pushback in your own mind about it as well. Yeah. So pivoting then to, let's talk about a little bit about mindset. Let's shift over to your Get Over Yourself podcast and kind of what you're sharing your message there. The self-limiting beliefs and the limitations of people in general, but obviously we're talking a little bit more to that younger generation as well. Talk to me about what your mission is with your podcast, your podcast platform, who you're trying to reach, the message you're trying to convey or you know, convey there on your podcast. Talk yeah. to me about that a little bit. Yeah, so I'll start this summer. My podcast will be three years old. So in the grand scheme of podcasters, not crazy long, but for the average podcaster, it's a decent time. Since starting it, it's been able to touch the lives of a lot of people, which I'm incredibly grateful for. And I give God all the credit towards it because a lot of times, just like you do, Randy, I'll interview somebody and for whatever reason, they say something that just hits home for somebody who's listening. And I've had countless messages of random people. I have no idea who they are. Reach out and say, Hey, your guest this week or something I said, whatever it may be that hit home. And I needed to hear that right then. So the reason why I originally started it, if you haven't been able to figure this out by now, I've mentioned BYU. I live in Provo, Utah. So I'm LDS, a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, and much like if anyone out there listening knows, you probably know somebody who went on an LDS mission out of high school or maybe it was a college friend of yours or something like that, maybe a fam distant family member. Um, so right after I graduated high school, I went on an LDS mission uh, down to southern Brazil. And so while I was there, I mean, your entire purpose while you're doing this missionary work is like our missionary motto, our like mission statement is to help invite others come unto Christ. And it goes deeper into that, but our entire focus is helping people come closer to Christ. And so how we do that is serving them in any way we possibly can. And so what you learn for two years when you're on these missions is basically loving God's children, becoming friends with everybody, serving them. And also putting your needs aside and making sure you could focus on helping somebody else. And so right when I got off my mission, there's kind of this weird paradigm shift where you just dedicated your entire two years of your life for Christ and his children and God's children here on this earth. And you want to keep helping them. But at the same time, you spend all your money out there. You don't make any money doing missionary work. So I'm out of cash. I need to go to school. I need to start working like real world kicks in as well. And so when I finished my mission, I got home, I was kind of sitting there and pondering and praying one day. And I was thinking to myself, okay, I like helping people. I clearly learned that on my mission. But at the same time, like I mentioned, I got to start working for myself. I got to start making money and try and build something here. And so one day when I was praying, I was like, all right, God, what's a way I can kind of combine the two? I'm all about bridging these gaps, like I already mentioned earlier. And so um, for whatever reason, I wasn't even huge into podcasts back then, but I got it in my mind, it said, start a podcast. And so I never really looked back. I, I got that in my head when I was praying one day, and then I started about two or three days later. And since then, it's just been growing and growing. So, okay. So you had this download. We'll call it a download that said start a podcast. Two or three days later, you started. And so I know your message is about set, you know, shutting down the, the limiting thoughts and the limiting beliefs and all that kind of stuff. So if someone's out there listening right now thinking, how in the world can you go from an idea to implementation? I don't, I don't know where, what microphone I need. I don't know what camera I need. I don't even know what software, you know what I mean? The, the doubts start to creep into their mind. How did, you, how did you bridge that gap? How did you get from the idea to getting it out there, right, to get started? Yeah, I had no idea about any of that either. <laughs> Go back and uh, listen to my first episode. It's uh, pretty janky, but it's fun. I had uh, uh, The entire process was quite simple. I put it out on my Instagram saying, I'm starting a podcast. It will be out in two days. This is my accountability and so, something stupid like that. And so like I told everyone, all right, I'm going to do it. So I'm a man of my word. So I had to make sure I was doing it. That was my freshman year at BYU. And so I looked it up. They had a podcasting studio, actually like a little recording room with microphones and um, soundproof walls and whatnot. So I said, all right, got the microphone, bring my laptop and try and figure this out. I messaged uh, an old companion I had on my mission. Uh, really cool dude. Some of these LDS missionaries, if they ever knock on the, on your door, you got to recognize they're, they're, a lot of them are really young and exciting young men and young women who are pretty cool when I'm not saying they're not cool when they wear a name tag, but I'm not going to lie. We look pretty nerdy when we're riding our bikes in our white shirt and ties. Um, but <laughs> some of these people have really cool stories. So one guy I got um, kind of paired up with on my mission at one point, um, he was a DJ um, before he went out. That's how he paid for his entire mission. He DJ Donald Trump's inauguration. Like he had some very big ticket uh, clientele and then he gave it up to go work um, for Christ. I guess you can call it for two years. So anyways, message him. Good DJ buddy of mine. I say, Hey, 
making a podcast. All cool podcasts have an intro song. Can you make me a little intro? And he goes, I got you. So he sends me over an intro like a day later. So this is between day one and three of releasing it. I kind of mash it all together. I go to the recording studio. Um, I don't even remember what I talked about on my first episode. You can go listen to that. <laughs> Probably something dumb. But I hit record, added the music, put it out there, and never look back. And you said you're three years into it almost? Yeah. And I think I saw about 120, 130 episodes maybe up at this point, give or take, maybe a couple. Yeah, give or take. I, I try and record in advance, so I don't know exactly what I'm on right now, but yeah, I over just, 100. I was just, yeah, just doing some research on you today. I think that's what I saw, at least 120. And so yeah. congratulations on that. That's a huge accomplishment. And the ability to then, so that's, it kind of comes full circle with what you've shared with us so far, as far as your ability to have that entrepreneurial mind from an early stage of your life, right? Seeing that obviously action is required to be able to get a result and not being afraid to make a mistake. I think a lot of times folks are afraid of, of that. Okay. What's people going to think? Well, how is it going to turn out? It's like you just said, your first episode probably wasn't the best episode. I would guarantee if you go back and listen to mine, mine wasn't either. You try to get better. Talk about the limiting mindset that you might've come across uh, from other people when you're either coaching or teaching other people and how you help them bridge that gap to just keep moving forward, keep stepping into that messy action that's going to you know get to the result that they're actually looking for. Mm -hmm. You know, what's interesting about that is on my first episode, despite it not being my favorite, it's one of my proudest, obviously, because it showed that I got started. Um, at the same time, I was very self-conscious, actually. I put this out there for the world to hear. I have probably plenty of friends thinking, what on earth? What am I going to learn from you? And at the same time, I was like, okay, for whatever reason, God told me I got to do this. So I'm going to do it. So there's like the sense of like, okay, I need to, because you listen to God. That's rule number one. <laughs> um, but also I didn't want to for the most part. So I remember when I was uh, in post-production, I had just finished recording. I think it was only like a 10 minute episode. Anyone can ramble on for 10 minutes and hit record and hit finish. I remember in the post-production though, I was going through and editing it all. And every single time I would say the word like, um, all these filler words that we're so accustomed to in our English language nowadays, I would get so self-conscious thinking everyone's going to think I'm stupid if I keep saying all these words. And looking back now, hopefully I've become a bit, a little bit more of a better speaker where I don't say these things as much. But looking back now, I frankly don't care. I, I, I look back now and I listen to some of my favorite podcasts that are out on the market today. And if you actually sit back and you listen to how many likes and ums they say, it's hundreds per episode. And so I realized just from that small time at the beginning when I would spend 10 minutes recording an episode and three hours on post-production, I said, okay, something's not, something's not working here. I'm not a famous music producer. Or I'm not making the world's greatest YouTube video or anything like this is a simple podcast. Nobody's going to care if there's a tiny mistake. And so since then, I've worked with a couple of different organizations sharing that same kind of message. Ever since working on Get Over Yourself, I've actually worked with a couple sales organizations where if you think of a one industry where you can get inside of your own headspace, besides a professional athlete, I think sales is right there. You have these people day in and day out. If they don't hit their quotas, they're not making money. They're getting fired. They don't get a paycheck if they don't hit their quotas. And so one area that I was able to use some of my quote unquote expertise was working with these sales organizations and helping them understand little things inside of their life. People aren't ever trying to bring them down, but they might just not resonate exactly with the product. And so some of the messages that I would share with them are quite simple of just, Hey, if Randy rejects what you're trying to sell to him, that doesn't necessarily mean Randy doesn't like you. He might not like the product. He might not see a need for it. Honestly, you probably sucked at selling him the product, but that doesn't mean he actually doesn't like you. I'm sure if you guys sat down and you, and you grabbed a drink together, you'd be best friends, but helping them recognize that. And obviously there's a million strategies in between, but I think that's a good life principle that everyone listening today can take away from the person who flips you off down the road, a boss that got angry with you that doesn't know you very well. The one of the higher ups you don't speak to that often. These people, if you're trying to sell them and they don't understand you, nobody ever will really reject you as a person. You might feel like that sometimes, but overall you just weren't able to convey your message or show them what you're trying to do. And so I think that's a very powerful message everyone could take away for today. And that's where your get over yourself comes from. Is that not correct? As far as that's where being aware, becoming aware of these beliefs or thoughts that are going on in your mind, 
taking control of them to the best of your ability, right? And then just letting them go, just letting them go, understanding that everybody, this is what I was taught. So there again, this might be, maybe it's just worded in a different way, maybe then then you'll bring to us. I'm looking forward to what your answer or response will be. But as far as everybody out there is 99% of the time, just worried about themselves. They're not even focusing on what you're doing or what so and so what anybody else is doing. So when when you have or see a reaction going on and you're putting it projecting onto them, thinking that, like you said, that they don't like you or that they don't appreciate you and all that kind of stuff. In reality, it's not even they're not even thinking about you. They've they're beyond that and they're already thinking about what they're off to the next thing that they want to get done. I, that might have been a little bit of a word of an explanation, but is that the gist of kind of get over yourself and kind of what you try to talk about within your podcast platform? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the theory or why I called it get over yourself to begin with, um, it actually started off as a joke when I was a lot younger. Back when I was in middle school, I remember I had friends and you could kind of play along with me here, Randy. What When you're in middle school, what are some of the biggest concerns you have inside of your life? You had kids you or you can think back to your own experiences. Think about yeah, what were the biggest say, concerns? Sports and the girls for sure. Pretty much you got two of the three on my list. So the first one, <laughs> if you're one of the big concerns, if you're going to play good in your sporting event that night, make sure you make all the yep. highlights. And if there's any scouts watching back in middle school, you'll make the big team. I can't <laughs> is whether or not your crush likes you back. I got that one on my list. And then the third one I always have on my list that I share is if uh, you get a good grade on your test or, you know, just in yeah, class. See, the school thing wasn't my thing. That's why I kind of left that off the list, but I understand okay, it's there important you go. as well. Yeah. So <laughs> anyways, my point is back when you were younger, um, and obviously there's circumstances depending on your family situations. There's other things that obviously come into play, but for the most part, a young kid in middle school, they have very few stresses inside of this world. Their life is pretty dang simple. And I just remember when I was back in middle school, I had friends who they would walk out of that test and they'd get a bad grade. They would walk up to their crush at recess or at lunch, I guess in middle school, and they would ask them out and they would say, no, they would play bad in their basketball game that night, you know, whatever it was. And they would always be so sad. And I, I had those moments too, of course. Um, but I just remember I would used to joke with them and say, eh, you're fine. Get over yourself. Uh, I got my buddy Zach over here. Zach just, uh, just bummed his test. I'm so angry. Eh, you're fine. Get over yourself. And so back then, my friends thought it was very annoying. And I was kind of just doing it to rub them the wrong way just to kind of get a reaction out of them. But over the next few years, I recognized that that phrase or that theory of get over yourself had a lot more power behind it, um, taking it aside from the joke and saying, telling somebody else they have to get over themselves and applying it to my own life and saying, okay, no matter what curveball God throws me today, no matter how somebody else reacts to me and my situation in life, no matter what any kind of circumstance occurs, I can get over myself. I could have the worst day possible and I will go to bed that night feeling happy. I have that capability. I could have the best day ever and go to bed recognizing that tomorrow is just going to be better. And so whatever life is throwing at you personally, whoever's listening out there right now, that's my challenge I want to leave with you is use that theory of get over yourself and say, okay, if today sucked, that's okay. We're going to get over ourselves and we're going to say tomorrow's going to be great. I'm going to learn what I learned today and I'm going to apply it for tomorrow to make tomorrow better. Today was the best day of your entire life. Ask yourself why, formulate that for tomorrow and make something even better happen. And so there you go. Love that. So one of my mentors, one thing he always shares that it resonated with me a lot. Maybe this will resonate with you as well, but our, the greatest gift, one of the greatest gifts we've ever been given is our ability to choose. And that's kind of what I'm hearing you say, meaning you have the ability in any moment at any time with whatever situation's going on is to choose how to respond positive, negative, let it roll off your back, right? Is that kind of what I'm hearing as well? As far as the choice, it really comes down to the, the person having the ability to have the awareness, but then to make a different choice in that certain certain circumstance to obviously get a different outcome. Is yeah. that what I'm hearing you say? Definitely. And promise me, you're not going to focus on cutting that part out. You got to leave the certain circumstance mishap in there. You got you to learn to love it. <laughs> but no, yeah, absolutely. There's uh, plenty of moments inside of our lives these small moments that in the grand scheme of things have no actual value that we just let them control our, our entire days, weeks, months, years. And it's kind of sad. One of the ones, and I, I talk about this all the time and my wife makes fun of me with it all the time. One of the areas I'm constantly trying to improve on is I get so frustrated when there's bad drivers around me. Um, if somebody cuts me off, if uh, they won't let me in a turn lane when I need to turn, somebody speeds by me when I'm uh, riding on my motorcycle, like anything dumb like that, 
it just makes me so angry and it, it encapsulates my head. I'll be on the phone with somebody sometimes and somebody will cut me off and I'll start screaming at them while I'm talking to someone else. And, and then I always have to look back and remind myself like, okay, I have been that stupid driver before I've made the late turn. I've cut somebody off. I've sped by somebody before I've done something dumb. They probably were just making a mistake. Once again, it was nothing intentional against me. They probably were just going through something. And yes, I'm still working on that one a ton. I'll probably yell at somebody later today, but it's recognizing that we're working on it. <laughs> we're all a work in progress, right? We're all trying to get a little better at all that personal growth. And at least you're doing it at your age. What, how did you tell me you were? 23? Yep. 23. So imagine, yeah, I sit here and think, man, if I knew what you know and what I feel like I know at 23, goodness, where I would be when you get to be my age. So congratulations on all the work that you're doing, all of the... Uh, the content that you're producing, uh, working with Connor there, creating your product, right? The AI tool. That's going to be super cool. I can't wait to hear more about how that evolves and everything that goes along with your life as well. So this has been a lot of fun. I knew this was going to be a great conversation. Hopefully you'll have a chance. Maybe we'll come back on in a year or two or whenever, right? To talk about where everything is, is advancing. I would love to try to keep connected with you try to have you back on and maybe share with what you're seeing uh, from that perspective of a younger generation. Maybe you can kind of help me with that within my podcast. That'd be awesome. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you, Randy, for everything you've built here. Um, for everyone who is listening, just know I've been on plenty of podcasts before and not every host is engaged. I'm sure if you've listened to a podcast before, it's very difficult to get into them sometimes. So what Randy's doing is something special. Well, appreciate that. I, I try, if that makes any sense. I actually put some effort into it. So hopefully, I, I appreciate you saying that because sometimes you just don't know whether it's it's uh, noticed or not. So that that I appreciate that a ton. So as we start to bring this one in for a close, I would love for you, we've shared a ton of wisdom. We've gone through the business, kind of where you've been in your life as far as building businesses and that kind of stuff. We started to dive a little bit into the personal development and getting over yourself and making different decisions in life. I'd love to try to dig out one more nugget of wisdom out of you to try to share with the, the listeners. So maybe pretend or it's not even pretending. Maybe think of yourself as obviously you're that younger generation that I'm trying to help with on my podcast. Speak to them. Give some them some inspiration, some things of uh, maybe a different perspective of a way of looking at the way things are going on in life. And, and uh, let's see if we can't help them bridge that gap maybe of, of you know, just not even knowing where to begin with a lot of things that are going on in life. Yeah. Um. You know, before you kind of frameworked that question a little bit, um, you told me at the beginning of the episode, right before we hit record, you kind of close out with a big question. There's usually one I usually I answer with at the end for almost every show I go on, but I want to change it a little bit today. Um, I was recently talking with a friend of mine um, here at BYU as well. He served a mission as well for the, for our church, and he had the unique situation. He actually served in Ukraine just a few months. He left Ukraine a few months before the war broke out. I think he left about four or five months beforehand. And uh, one thing he was telling me, when he lived in some of these cities in northeastern Ukraine, kind of up closer towards Russia, away from the, um, the capital of Kiev, he said everything in that world, in that, in that region of the world, seemed very dark and like there was no hope. Obviously, it was interesting to him because he, he was bringing a message of hope of Jesus Christ to other people, to a, an area that a lot of them have never even heard about it. But what he said is when they would walk the streets and they would talk to people, everything just seemed so dark and gloomy. I mean, even the buildings he mentioned were just gray and dark. There was no color to them. The parks were just dead trees. You know, like there's no life to some of these cities. And so he said what was interesting is even despite all the darkness and what kind of the world surrounded him, there would still be glimmers of hope that he would say in his day-to-day -day life. And what was so interesting to him is despite all the craziness going on there, I mean, he lived in some cities that are completely bombed out, that have been destroyed now. And he just thinks, and he, he keeps contact with some of the people he knew there. And one message that he has constantly still been able to see, despite that it might not look like it, it might not feel like it. They're in one of the biggest hells on earth right now that's currently out there. Um, they still have hope, which is so interesting. So I feel like if people who are in these situations who us here, everyone who's listening in the US, we have zero issues in the world right now. Are we, we have issues, but like in the grand scheme of things, they don't matter. If you could just sit back and find the hope, whatever that may be, if that's finding God, if that's uh, working on your physical health, if that's finding a relationship, like whatever your hope needs to be, focus on that. Because if the people of Ukraine could find that right now, despite their situation, I promise you, you could find it in yours. 
Love that. That's a great way to wrap this one up. Thank you for sharing that that story. So if people are out there like, okay, I need to figure out, get a little bit closer to Brandon. I need to learn more about his podcast, what the things that he's active in. Uh, what are the best places for people to learn more about you and get con- in connection uh, with you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if anyone ever wants to reach out to me on my show on Get Over Yourself podcast, um, at the episode description below, you can always find my email or any other contact method and find my social medias. Happy to reach out to anyone who has any questions. Likewise, um, anyone out there, if you're a business owner and you're interested in Interval, we mainly target automotive repair shops, but we actually have a couple medical offices and random groups within there that use us as well. So anyone who's interested in hearing more about that, you can find us at interval-ai.com. Interval-ai.com. I'm going to be checking out interval-ai.com just just to learn more, right? I just that's super fascinating, super cool, and I appreciate you sharing everything you did. There's so many more things we could have got into that at some point we got to start moving on with the with the podcast episode. But yeah, that's where hopefully maybe one of these days we'll be able to get back on it and learn a little bit more. So, anyways, folks, as I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, I knew this was going to be a lot of fun. I absolutely love connecting with the younger generations. I really do. It's, I don't know if it's because it's they're my kids' age. I'm not sure exactly where it comes from, but I absolutely love trying to figure out and learn what they're thinking, what they're seeing. You know, I don't, I try not to be blinded by the things, you know, obviously I might have a little bit more wisdom with marriage and relationships and those kinds of things based on my years of experience. But at the same time, there's so many things that we can learn from a younger perspective that if we can kind of just take it, internalize it, and then try to apply some of it, you know, who knows where that could take us. And, and we talked about the AI. I think AI is a perfect example that it is you, if you are an older individual, let's say older than 35, if you can just get your mind wrapped around about what's the potential, some of that hope that he mentioned in that last story, there's so many great things that are going to be coming to us as humans here in the United States and around the world. Just try to embrace it a little bit and try to re- embrace some of that younger generation. And Brandon is a perfect example of a young man that's out there absolutely killing it. And so, yeah, super cool. Glad we were able to connect and meet Brandon. I appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you. Absolutely. So, folks, go out there. Have a fantastic day. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your family and friends. I would greatly appreciate that. That's the only way I really have to uh, grow the podcast is I'm trying to spread it uh, as far and as wide as I possibly can so I can bring on more great guests just like Brandon here today. Uh, So, please. Uh, share it with your family and friends. If you'd like to go out to your favorite podcast platform and leave me a review, that would be also much appreciated as well. So go out there, as I mentioned, have a fantastic day. And I look forward to coming back to you with another episode with another fantastic guest. And until then, thank you for joining me on the Rich Mind Podcast. And remember, your external world is a reflection of what's going on inside of you. So focus every day on that internal battle and win within. Until next time, my friends.